Hello, my name is Ross Davis. This is the first in a series of seven videos on joining up the arts and the sciences. These talks were first given at the Australian National University between 2005 and 2009. This particular talk is an introduction to biological literary criticism, the Iliad and Conrad Lorenz's ideas on aggression. It was first given on the 8th of December 2005 and is now being given on Friday the 18th of December 2015. At some unthinkable first time in history, say several million years ago, a fish, who we will call Fish A, noticed at a fair distance a member of his own species, Fish B. And Fish A suspected that Fish B had hostile intentions. Two possibilities jumped into Fish A's mind at more or less the same time. One, I will attack this fish. And two, I will run away from this fish. Without being terribly agitated about the possibility of doing either, Fish A turned itself side on to the still quite distant Fish B and raised its dorsal fin, getting ready to either move toward Fish B or away from it when it had finished doing its thinking. Meanwhile, Fish B, which had noted the presence of Fish A and had witnessed the sideways turn, was uncertain about its own intentions, when suddenly it noticed the actual size of Fish A, which was made even greater by the full extension of the dorsal fin. And it thought, whoa, this fish is big. I cannot either actually engage this fish in a fight or suffer a full attack from it. Even though it is exposing its belly to me, I will run away. This episode taught Fish A and Fish B and all the Fish A's and Fish B's of this species to come a valuable lesson. Despite the accidental nature of its origins and the general oddness of the activity, they had learnt that turning side on to an aggressor and raising your dorsal fin could settle a dispute without violence. Soon after the Fish A, Fish B encounter, female fish of this species became interested in those male fish which were able to perform these displays. And further encouraged by this development, male fish started to exaggerate the display, especially when they were a little more inclined to attack than to run. They even managed to express colour in their flesh to add to the performance. The little evolutionary sketch I have just given is an account of how a species learns to display and how a species goes on over a period of millennia to perform the display in a way that might be called ritualized. The activity that I have described in the sketch would be well known to fish specialists. It is called broadsiding and is well attested more widely in nature. Red deer, for instance, trot beside each other for a distance in what is called a parallel walk, which allows for a sizing up process to be carried out. When one of the contending males thinks he can't win, he backs off even before a fight can begin. A number of points need to be noted in regard to this animal behaviour. One is that the display always contains a certain amount of aggression. Two is that the amount of aggression is always in some degree measured. Otherwise, fish A would simply just attack fish B with no warning. Three is that the display doesn't have, so to say, a primary military function. For fish A to be side on to fish B is actually a comparatively unattractive military positioning. If you put all these ideas together, what you have is an evolutionary method which enables individual members of a species to express their capabilities, even if that capability is bluster, to their conspecifics, members of their own species, despite the odd nature of the signalling involved. 
in a way that keeps aggression within certain reasonable limits. One might say that ritual allows aggression to be both expressed and regulated. In the Iliad, there are all manner of ritualized displays, both threatening displays like those of fish A, but also submissive displays, which we will deal with in due course. The displays are words, physical postures, attire, and architecture. By way of a quick example, I'll mention just one. Hector's Koruthaiolos, the shining, shimmering helmet, with the shining and shimmering, referring most likely to the graduated hair or bristles that run above the actual helmet from top to back. Like the raised dorsal fin of our broadsiding fish, the shining, shimmering helmet is making the wearer look bigger and is specifically designed for maximum optical effect. It performs, as far as I know, no military function whatsoever. Interestingly, highly aggressive territorial sedentary fish are among the most vigorous displayers in the world of fish. So a comparison with the principal defender of a city, such as Hector, is hard to miss. The Iliad, and indeed all art, is composed of individual elements such as Hector's headgear that can be understood as ritualized remnants of earlier evolutionary conditions. Practitioners of biological literary criticism could presumably spend their entire lives pointing these out. But our interests are wider. Let's turn to the more substantial literary critical assertion that the whole of the Iliad should be seen as evolutionary. With regard to this, we will look at Achilles and Patroclus. In the Iliad, there is a plot dominating relationship between two Greek warriors, Achilles and Patroclus. Are they a homosexual couple? Well, there's no real evidence for this. And we do have the detail at 9663 that Achilles provided women, one by the spear, as consorts for both himself and Patroclus. Probably not the behavior of the determined homosexual male. So what then? If you look in the back of my English translation of the Iliad, you are told in a list of personae that Patroclus is boon friend of Achilles. I put it to you that this is a fudge, a fudge of this kind. In English, there is an expression boon companion, which means a jolly convivial buddy from French bon. This doesn't seem to describe Patroclus. It would never occur to me to think of Patroclus as a barrel of laughs. There is another expression in English, boon man or boon worker, from Norse, boon, prayer, petition. This is someone who works for a Lord and is not paid for doing so, probably because he's incurred a debt with the Lord. Now, whilst we do know from the text 2386 that Patroclus came to the court of Peleus under the distress of murder pollution, having murdered someone during a game of dice, in the Iliad, there is no real alluding to the idea that Patroclus is a boon worker, i.e. someone who's discharging a debt. If you think that is precisely what we've been told in book 23, then I would reply that we are being told that very late in the story. The boon friend fudge, however, is an attempt to deal with a glaring interpretational problem. What sort of friend is it that takes orders from you to perform menial tasks? Bring out the girl Briseis and give her to these men. One, three, three, seven. Put out an ampler wine bowl. Use more wine for each and place a cup for each. Nine, two, oh, three. Then in the same scene, after he has stoked the fire, raked the coals, cooked the meat on extended spits, seasoned the meat with pure salt and passed round the bread in baskets, Patroclus is told by Achilles, and whilst you're about it, make an offering to the gods. 9, 2, 2, 1. 
In the scene with the mentor, Lord Phoenix, Achilles knits his brows and nods to Patroclus to pile up rugs for Phoenix bed. Nine, six, two, nine. And at 11, 611, Achilles sends off Patroclus as an errand boy to ask Nestor about a newly arrived man at the ships. Apparently, the great runner is happy to delegate legwork. And notice what formula on three occasions follows these orders. Patroclus did the bidding of his friend. One, three, four, five. Patroclus did as his companion bade him, 9206. Doing as his companion willed, 11616. In short, Patroclus does what he's told. But whilst he's performing his menial tasks, the text continually insists that he's some sort of god or godlike personage or at the very least in the very highest ranks of humans. Lord Patroclus, 1336. Like a god in firelight, 9212. And on his errand at 11647, Patroclus appears standing at the door like a god. So what sort of relationship is this really? It's not substantively homosexual, not that of a jolly boon companion, and the designation of boon worker, despite the menial unpaid tasks, can't be easily applied to a god. I suggest that all these ideas are wrong. Patroclus is a friend, but not an ordinary friend. He's an ideal, perfect friend. How many friends can be told, do this, do that, and they just do it? Answer, only one your fantasy friend. Let's do a quick run through of Patroclus' career in the Iliad. He is first mentioned at the moment of Achilles' lowest ebb in the aftermath of the humiliation at the hands of Agamemnon. He accompanies Achilles away. He's there for him. One, three, one, nine. Then there are the menial tasks for Achilles that we've just outlined. Then there is a swerve in his role as ideal friend. He becomes an ideal friend for other people. He plays Florence Nightingale to the wounded Eurypolis, tending the wound with medical know-how and engaging him in comforting conversation. 11838. Also, he cries over the fate of the Achaean warriors being killed by the Trojans, who at this stage of the story are pressing right to the beached ships, 16. Finally, he proves to be the ultimate buddy. He goes and fights Achilles' war for him. He goes into battle in Achilles' armour and as a sort of proxy for Achilles. And in doing so, he's acting as a friend to all the Achaeans. So the question still is, what are we actually dealing with in the Achilles-Patroclus friendship? To answer this question, we need to turn to nature. In certain birds, think geese, and notably in higher vertebrates, especially those that operate in packs and gangs, there are necessarily very high levels of aggression. The purpose of the very high levels of aggression is for attacks on prey, but they are also required for handling conspecific packs. But the levels of aggression required within these packs create a problem. How are the individual members going to deal with each other in their highly pumped up state? The answer is through submissive gestures and the taking on of submissive roles. The gangs of chimpanzees, baboons, wolves and wild dogs are only able to function because certain members within the pack are prepared to lower their aggression and take on subordinate roles. This necessarily leads to a high level of stratification in the pack, sometimes called pecking order, a term that emerged during ethological studies of hens in the 1920s, which noted that hens wouldn't back off till they had been pecked 
say two, three, four, five, ten times, creating quite literal levels of hardihood, e.g. this hen is a level three. It can endure three pecks but no more. Most animals, however, don't peck, and most of the hierarchies are not so literal. Instead, the behaviour of a stratified aggressive pack, as with the fish A, fish B story, is heavily ritualised. The main method for showing status involves greeting ceremonies, and these operate with two males or a mating pair or two females, but sometimes a large number of individuals participate. Whilst, as I have said, there is always a degree of aggression in a display, the main purpose of the ceremony is for one participant to show submission. This usually involves some clear indication that you are prepared to be in the presence of a conspecific whilst in a vulnerable attitude by, for instance, placing the head low or exposing the stomach. In the specific case of birds, turning away the beak or even screwing the head round and offering the nape. Largely on the basis of his detailed studies of grey lag geese, the famous ethologist Conrad Lorentz called these, often incredibly noisy, displays triumph rite ceremonies. What I'm suggesting to you today is that this is precisely how one should understand the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus. They are triumph rite ceremony partners. Whilst operating in an environment where there are high levels of aggression being directed at a conspecific gang, i.e. the Trojans, and where high levels of aggression are only just below the surface within their own group, triumphrite partners Achilles and Patroclus are quite able to be in each other's presence in Achilles' hut playing at performing the rather refined human variations of the roles and rituals enacted by other aggressive pack vertebrates. Is there any specific allusion to their triumph partner status? Yes. Aigars deu te pate kai athenaie kai apollon metetis un troon thanaton fugoi hosoi e asi Metetis argeon noi dec dumen olestron, of oioi troies hiera credemna luomen. 16100. Ah, Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo, if not one Trojan of them all should get away from death, and not one Argive save ourselves were spared, we two alone could pull down Troy's old coronet of towers. This is a strange passage. It's a sort of solemnized daydream. Solemnized because the gods are invoked and a daydream because, for some reason, Achilles is put in mind of a hypothetical and weird situation where everyone at Troy is dead except for Patroclus and himself. To me, it sounds piratical. Ay, me arty, just you and me will conquer the Spanish main. Even the Igar, Igar, sounds a bit piratey. It also sounds like the sentiment of an Islamic terrorist wanting to tear down the towers and walls of civilization. The ritualized, threatening, intimidatory architecture the hiera credemna. But what is of most interest from an evolutionary point of view is that this passage contains the ideation for the ultimate triumphalist statement. We exist and nobody else does. Is there any specific clue to the notion that Homer himself knows about the subtleties of ritualized submission? Yes. He addresses in the Iliad basically only two people as you, Patroclus and Menelaus. Why? I think this is possibly because these are his two pet projects. The two principles that have to play second fiddle roles at Troy, Patroclus as ideal friend, 
for the hypertrophically aggressive Achilles and more generally for the hypertrophically aggressive Achaeans. And Menelaus, as younger brother, as cuckolded man, and as a warrior of only second tier significance. Someone who even goes so far as to want to spare the life of a Trojan, 648. Further to this, Homer shows what happens when the nicely weighted roles of dominance and submission within a gang of conspecifics breaks down when the triumph rite ceremony partners are separated. Patroclus, who has only been given the brief by Achilles of dislodging the Trojans from the Achaean ships, becomes a possessed entity, taking the battle all the way to the walls of Troy. 16705. Now, three times Patroclus assaulted the high wall at the tower joint, and three times Lord Apollo threw him back with counter blows of his immortal hands against the resplendent shield. The Achaean, then a fourth time, flung himself against the wall more than human in fury. 16785. And fierce Patroclus hurled himself upon the Trojans in onslaughts fast as Ares. Three times wild yells in his throat. Each time he killed nine men. But on the fourth demonic foray, then the end of life loomed up for you, Patroclus. In these passages, there is a game being played with the numbers three and four. In Greek culture, three is the number of completion. And four, in this context, is the number of going too far. In his rampages, therefore, Patroclus is shown to have passed into some wild pathological condition with his attacks against stone walls, with the smerdalea iakon, terrible shrieking, and with the repeated phrase episuto daimoni isos, flung himself as if possessed, we are being presented with a man who has become demonic and is now out of control. And what happens when Achilles learns that he has lost his triumph right partner for good? At 1828, he lies down face first in the dirt in a ritualized posture of full abasement. In connection with this, take note of a passage from Lorenz. A grey lag, which does not have any partner with whom to perform the triumph ceremony, is permanently depressed and sits or stands about moping. Yerkes once said that one chimpanzee is not a chimpanzee at all, and a similar statement is even more emphatically true of a grey lag. Even within a populous colony of fellow members of its own species, a single individual not belonging to any triumph ceremony group suffers severely from its loneliness. If one produces such a sad state of affairs experimentally by rearing a goose in complete isolation from its own species, one can regularly observe a number of characteristic disturbances in the unhappy creature's response to its environment in general and to its social environment in particular. It is a matter of extreme interest that these disturbances are in many ways analogous to those observed by Rene Spitz in hospitalized children who were deprived of sufficient contact with adult human beings. He's dealing with a lot of World War II, children from World War II and the disastrous period after the war. What gets worse, what, uh, what gets more damage than all the other functions is the faculty of dealing actively with new environmental situations. So far from actively striving for new and rewarding stimuli and exploring their environment, these poor creatures try to avoid all forms of stimulation and act exactly as if these were painful to them. The attitude of lying prone in their cots with their faces turned towards the wall is symptomatic of damage done by hospitalization. Social contact is especially shunned, and even children who are only slightly damaged in this way never look each other, or for that matter, anybody else, straight in the face. 
on aggression, page 207. Conclusion. In this talk, with the help of our friends, Fish A and Fish B, we have tried to emphasize the deeply historical character of phenomena that are encountered in literature. This noble venture can be termed biological literary criticism. How does one do it? According to me, and as presented here, you start with nature, then you move to the text. Then as required, you move to and fro between nature and text, between biological realities and art critical problems. There are, however, two matters for analysis. The first is identifying single elements in the text as biological, such as Hector's Corotheolos. The second is something more profound and is what you really want to know, the evolutionary point of the whole work. In the Iliad, the point of the text is to both meditate on and pass comment on the expression of the differing levels of aggression both in threat displays and in submissive gestures, in the putatively, hypertrophically aggressive archaic Greeks, and with a specific interest in the career trajectory of the male who's backed down. Thanks.